The 90s was a magical time in Hollywood. Independent films were on the rise and studios were taking chances on unusual ideas or greenlighting obscure properties. The downside was that while many times after a film went into production, the studio would get cold feet and would desperately try to change the material. That's what happened to the 1995 movie Tank Girl. Not only was this based on a comic book character from an independent studio, but it was also only the second time a movie was based on a comic book with a female lead. The first was Supergirl all the way back in 1984. Tank Girl is a character created by Jamie Hewlett and Alan Martin. The comic was first published in the UK magazine Deadline in 1988, and eventually Dark Horse Comics in the US in 1991. Producer Tony Astor was a big fan of the comic and wanted to turn it into a feature. Rachel Talalay, who previously directed Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, as well as the very ahead of its time Ghost in the Machine, was dying to direct this film. She loved the over-the-top nature of the comics and was excited at the prospect of having a strong female lead. Talalay had worked with the wonderful John Waters for years, so she was used to working on films that most would call ridiculous. Talley repeatedly tried to get the option to direct, and after a year, they finally gave her the job. They began looking for a studio for the film. They approached Steven Spielberg, who was flattered, but said he wasn't hip enough to make the film. As a goof, they made up promotional shirts that said, too hip for Spielberg. Finally, they found some studios that were interested, and they got three offers. They went with United Artists since they offered them the most money for the film. They gave them a $25 million budget, which was still a small amount for what they had intended, but since that was the best offer they got, they moved forward. They had an open casting looking for the perfect actress to play the title role. Actress Lori Petty was fresh off of three major hits, Point Break, A League of Their Own, and Free Willy. She fell in love with the character and thought that she was the perfect one to play the role. She auditioned twice, and even after she found out that another actress got the job, she still told her friends that she was going to be in the movie. Shortly after announcing that actress Emily Lloyd got the job, she dropped out because she refused to shave her head for the role. Petty was then called up and jumped at the chance. She was the perfect choice for the character. On top of the fact that she already resembled the character, she had that goofy demeanor that seemed to come natural to her. They had 40 different wigs and who knows how many outfits for her, many right out of the comics, like the over-the-top bullet bra. Talley insisted on bringing in production designer Catherine Hardwick because of her great eye for bizarre visuals in films like Tapeheads and Freaked. Hardwick would eventually go on to be incredibly successful in directing the massive hit Twilight. They hired veteran actor Malcolm McDowell to play Kessley, the villain. He just finished Star Trek Generations and was looking to do something ridiculous. Petty wearing a bowler hat was an homage to him in A Clockwork Orange. Ice-T was brought in to play T-Saint, the leader of the Rippers. When he read the script, he didn't believe he was going to play a giant mutant kangaroo, so he was kind of surprised that that was exactly what he played. The comics took place in a post-apocalyptic Australia, hence the kangaroos. A young Naomi Watts played Jet Girl. She was still relatively new to acting, and this was the largest production she had been on up to this point. She was terrified on set and kept hiding behind Petty. Talley and Petty worked with her to help break her out of her shell on set. It's sad because now that she's a big star, Watts has said that she's ashamed of the film. Talley wanted the movie to be completely unconventional, like the comics, and here began the problems with the studio. Even though the reason they picked up the film was because of how weird it was, the studio fought the director because of how weird it was. They kept interfering and rewriting the screenplay. The cast fought back by ad-libbing chunks of dialogue. The movie went forward, but it was always a tug-of-war with the studio. They wanted to hire legendary effects master Stan Winston to work on the film, but with their limited budget, they couldn't afford him. Winston loved the concepts in the film so much that he cut his rate in half so they could hire him. He designed the Rippers and made their armor a fun play on another of his creatures. Creatures, the Predator. He was so proud of his designs on the Rippers, he has them in his museum, right next to his much more famous works like the Terminator and Alien. The Ripper makeup and prosthetics took three hours to apply. The tails, ears, nose, and mouth were all controlled by remote, and it took two people to control one Ripper. So in the scenes where all the Rippers were present, there were 16 people off screen controlling them. The Ripper outfits were hot and heavy, and the actors said it was like wearing a couch. Despite this, Ice-T never once complained. They asked him why, and he said, better than prison. The director met Iggy Pop while working on Crybaby and had him come in for a cameo. 
Adam Shankman, who worked with Tal Lay on John Waters' Hairspray, did the dance choreography for the Liquid Silver segment. Years later, he directed the remake of Hairspray. The Girl in the Box is Dawn Robinson from In Vogue. Early in the film, Tank Girl is discovered by a lone soldier. The soldier is played by Richard Schiff, who would go on to win Outstanding Supporting Actor for The West Wing. The guy here is a professor at UCLA and a friend of the director. He asked to be in the film. He taught Trey and Matt from South Park, and they based the character of Dr. Mephesto on him. Courtney Love wanted to be Subgirl, but dropped out when her husband Kurt Cobain killed himself. She eventually came back and helped as the music supervisor. While picking the music for the film, they found a little-known punk band called Green Day. They had them on a list of bands that they wanted for the soundtrack, but by the time they got to that point, Green Day blew up and they could no longer afford them. The opening was shot in White Sands, New Mexico. The whole fast motion scene petty ad-libbed. They couldn't afford some of the big action sequences with the tank and the jet, so instead of cutting them from the film, they had them animated. Since the movie already intercut moments from the comic books, the animation didn't feel out of place at all. They shot the Ripper's hideout in an abandoned bowling alley. Most of the buildings and all of the planes were models. As the movie progressed, the film suffered from an increased level of studio interference. Everything from fighting over having a female singer for the intro song to scenes the producers didn't like. There's a part where Tank Girl shoved in a freezer. This scene had some of the funniest jokes, and when they screened it for test audiences, it always scored as their favorite part of the film. The studio insisted that it be removed because Petty looked too ugly. They didn't remove it, but they had to trim it down, and the scene loses most of its humor. They also did more cutaway shots on McDowell instead of Petty. The executives kept cutting more and more out of the film. They didn't understand most of the jokes, so they had them removed. They didn't understand the tone of the film either, so they chopped out large chunks of the story. Talley fought them over this because with so much gone, the film no longer made sense. Major plot points were now gone. The studio just didn't care. The producers kept asking things like, What is Tank Girl's motivation? What's her backstory? What made her into Tank Girl? This just proved that they didn't understand the character at all. There's no need to go over all that. The character is just supposed to be ridiculously goofy. A sort of living Looney Tune, if you will. That's like asking for the backstory or motivation of Benny Hill. It doesn't add anything to the character, it just distracts from the time when they could be doing something funny. Even though the film was rated R, the producers still removed things that they found offensive. In the beginning of the film, they showed Tank Girl's room being covered in dildos. That would have been hilarious, but it's gone. Later, Tank Girl has sex with her boyfriend, Booga. Winston made a naked version of the character, complete with an 11-inch kangaroo penis. The studio panicked because the thought of the lead having sex with the kangaroo was too much for them. Did they not realize that this was just a movie? She wasn't actually having sex with the kangaroo. There was a major pushback from the director, and they were able to recut the film, but it still wasn't what they wanted. Most of the best lines were gone, along with plot points the studio refused to budge on, like an entire segment with Johnny Prophet, who created the Rippers. There was an alternate ending where Subgirl shows up and helps free the slaves. They then go outside, and now that water and power is no longer in control, it starts raining. After 92 days of shooting, the film wrapped. After all the infighting, the studio had final say, and the butchered cut of the film was released in the theaters in March 31st, 1995. It opened up against Tommy Boy and was obliterated. Critics didn't like it and audiences didn't understand it. This movie is often referred to as the film that ruined Petty's career. However, considering she's done 15 movies and 21 TV shows after this, I completely disagree. Her career is doing just fine. Despite all the troubles, she loves the movie and has many posters and props in her house. Talley made the film because she knew it was going to be a love it or hate it movie. It was unique and edgy and not designed to appeal to everyone. The movie was meant to be an oddball. The overly colorful sets, the juvenile dialogue, and a hero that has sex with a kangaroo was never destined to be something for a mainstream audience. It's like the studio jumped on the property, but then were embarrassed when they delivered exactly what they purchased. If you take five minutes to look at the comics, you'd see the frantic nature of the film is exactly like the books. Well, the parts that the studio didn't meddle with. Even though the final product is not what Talley wanted, the movie still has become a cult classic. Much of the humor was taken out, but they couldn't get rid of its charm. Seeing Petty flail around, making dick jokes, and generally being ludicrous is still entertaining. You can tell she really loved this. It really baffles me how some of these producers are in the business. They seriously asked questions like why does she have a different hairstyle in each scene, or why she was cooking a hot dog in the middle of a chase sequence. They just didn't get it. Much like the rebellious nature of the character, the movie still has fans, despite what the studio did to it. This movie is a wonderful gem. It's an absolute blast that makes no excuses for just how insane it is. It genuinely deserves its place in cult film history. Let's fall.
How much did they pay you to spy on us? Two dollars and fifteen cents. Shut up. Hey everyone, I just want to remind you, I have a Patreon set up. Uh, if you like the show and would like to help keep me going, even a dollar a month would make a difference. I would really appreciate it. I've got some cool rewards set up, so check it out. Thanks a lot.